Hi Facebook, how are you? It's Dr. Emily, podiatrist, human movement specialist, and the founder of the Evidence-Based Fitness Academy. Very excited to be doing this live little post because functional health illness is something that I think is highly misunderstood. In fact, the great toe, great toe dorsiflexion is highly misunderstood as well. The small joint is critical to the way that we move, not just in gait, but in a lot of the exercises we might be doing with our clients, a lot of the athletic movements that many of our athletes are doing. It can contribute to a lot of the injuries that our patients have. Probably one of the best examples of the importance of the great toe, movement dysfunction, injury performance, is how limited great toe dorsiflexion can actually lead to gluteal amnesia. And there's a lot of articles about this now. You could probably hop onto Google right now and you'll see stuff talking about, you know, big toe and the butt doesn't fire. Try to make that connection. Huge connection. Again, one of the easiest ways to connect. The reason why the great toe can lead to great toe mobility is that both of them play a very important role in late mid stance in, in that hip extension phase of gait. Now, First, we have to start by talking about the great toe in general. Big thing here, great toe when you're assessing it, grab my little foot models here, great toe when you're assessing great toe mobility with your clients, with your patients, with your athletes. First is during gait, during closed chain movements, your toe is not moving relative to your foot. Your foot is moving relative to your toe. So the problem with doing only open chain great toe assessments or doing open um, great toe assessments on ourselves and trying to just lift your toe and say, hey, my toe moves, that's not transferring to gait. That's not transferring to closed chain mechanics. Remember, toe stays fixed to the ground. Foot is moving relative to the great toe. And that means that that's really how you need to be assessing the great toe. Open chain assessments, still awesome. I do them in my office every single day. They're a baseline part of my assessment, but I must get my patients out of the chair and I must watch them walk. And I highly recommend that you do that as well. So when we talk about the great toe, we know that we have, this is your foot. All of these are our phalanges. I have a little broken phalange here, so do not mind that. All of these are our metatarsals, so metatarsals and phalanges. When you look at the great toe joint, that would be your metatarsal phalangeal joint. That would be your first MPJ, great toe or big toe. We need at least 30 degrees of dorsiflexion of our first MPJ when we walk. Ideal dorsiflexion is 65 to 75 degrees, and if you want to wear stilettos, women, you gotta have more than 65 to 75 degrees. You must have really around 90 degrees dorsiflexion in that big toe to walk properly in high heels. So when it comes to the great toe, it is not just a simple dorsiflexion that is happening. For anyone who has taken any of my workshops, BTS, Barefoot RX, we go into the mechanics of great toe dorsiflexion. You cannot talk about first MPJ dorsiflexion without talking about the first ray. If you've never heard of the first ray, you must understand the first ray when it comes to propulsion, push off, first MPJ dorsiflexion, and of course how that's going to influence the rest of the body. Your first ray is formed by your cuneiform, your medial cuneiform, and your first metatarsal. This is referred to as your metatarsal cuneiform joint, which is also known as your first ray. If we look at the foot that is not solid, so it'll actually move, if you grab your foot and you grab metatarsals two, three, four, five with one hand, grab metatarsal one with your other hand, move the hand that's holding metatarsal one and you're gonna move it up and down. That is your first ray that actually comes from the primitive foot. That was actually the opposable thumb in a primate or it is still the opposable thumb in a primate. And then that forms the first ray in the human foot. What differentiates the human foot from the primate foot is that we are bipedal. So your first ray is critical to bipedalism and human locomotion. Your first ray goes up, your first ray goes down. In order to get over your first MPJ or your great toe when we walk, when we do close chain movements, is that you must be able to plantar flex your first ray. That is critical. That is a critical step when you are assessing and when you are considering functional hallux limitus. Can your client, can your athlete properly and at the right time, plantar flex their first ray? 
huge. The muscle that plantar flexes the first ray is your peroneus longus. Your peroneus longus is opposed by the tibialis anterior on top. Together they form your spiral line and run into your obliques. So you could actually relate oblique issues all the way down to first ray issues, which means that that would ultimately lead to a first MPJ or a great toe issue. So first ray must plantar flex. Once it plantar flexes, you are then able to get over your first MPJ. Every time you dorsiflex your first MPJ, it actually goes through what's called sliding, gliding, and jamming. It is that gliding phase that is when the first metatarsal is plantar flexing. Let me show you real quick my assessment. So what is functional hallux limitus? Functional hallux limitus is a dynamic condition. It means that when you are assessing your client or your athlete open chain, they have great range of motion. However, when they get up close chain, they start walking, they start to lose that range of motion, they jam the first MPJ, and they're walking in a compensated way, just like somebody who has structural hallux limitus or has that limited first MPJ dorsiflexion. So it is a dynamic condition, which really must be assessed dynamically. So when we look here, we can see on this picture here, that this is the way that oftentimes, if you Google, how do I assess for functional health limits, this is what often comes up. It is an open chain assessment. Yes, you can do this. Yes, I do this on my patients every single day. However, I would not only do this and build your correctives around this. I would also include a closed chain gait assessment to look at their first MPJ dorsiflexion. So we see that. And then here, this is another way that people will often assess the first MPJ. Why I do not like this is for two reasons. First one, the knee is bent. During gait, your knee is not bent. Your knee is extended, which means it is not transferring to how we actually walk. Second reason why I do not like this too much is that you are again moving the toe relative to the foot. This is not a position. This might tell you, can your client go into a lunge? Can your client do um, perhaps certain yoga poses? and uh, maybe certain other exercises that involve this specific position. However, this in itself is not, a, not an assessment for functional hallux limitus. A gait assessment really is the best assessment for functional hallux limitus. So this is an exaggeration, but this is how a client would present when they are walking with a functional hallux limitus. So let's say that this client I assessed them open chain. I saw that they had great first MPJ dorsiflexion, no crepitus, um, no limitation in that dorsiflexion, no pain, etc. And then they start walking and they start to turn out. This is actually called a low gear push off. You can see that they're turning out. So something is happening in the foot that is causing them to block that first MPJ dorsiflexion and abduct that foot. So this is what I would start looking at. Another thing that you would want to consider is certain foot types which are at risk for functional hallux limitus. So I always know when a patient comes in and they complain of pain in their first MPJ, they have pain right along the, right along the dorsal joint line. I take an x-ray, their joint looks perfect, it looks healthy. Then I watch them walk and they have all of these compensations. So I know that it's something dynamically in that sliding, gliding, jamming process, which involves first ray plantar flexion, the timing is off. What they're doing is they're jamming the first MPJ, they're pinching that capsule within the first MPJ, and they are starting to get pain. The most common foot type that you will see that in is the overpronated foot. Reason why you see that most common in the overpronated foot is that when our foot everts, like it does in an overpronated foot, is you destabilize the STJ and the medial column of the foot. When you destabilize the medial column of the foot and the subtalar joint, you then destabilize the peroneus longus. You essentially put the muscle that we need to plantar flex the first ray on slack. So now you're starting to throw off the neuromuscular coordination of the locking phase of the foot. If you cannot lock your foot at the right moment, you will then jam your first MPJ and get what is called functional hallux limitus, capsulitis, synovitis, etc. The end result of chronic functional hallux limitus is what's referred to as a dorsal bunion or hallux rigidus. We can see on that x-ray that there is a lot of spurring going on. The cause of that spurring is not 
a hallux valgus or a traditional bunion, which is where you lose centration of the first MPJ and that causes the arthritis. It's actually that you are jamming and if you keep hitting bone together every time you take a step, that will lead to arthritis. That will lead to this hallux rigidus. So I can tell based on a patient who's been jamming and had functional health limitus for years and years and they often present like this. You can also have a structurally dorsiflexed first ray. So you always want to think about structural drivers to functional hallux limitus. But again, to summarize, great toe first MPJ, we need at least 30 degrees of dorsiflexion. The most important step in first MPJ dorsiflexion is first ray plantar flexion. Your first ray must always be assessed in your clients, patients, and athletes. What destabilizes our first ray is when your client, patient, athlete, has a medial column instability, subtalar joint eversion. What that does is it throws off the spiral line and the ability of the pronius longus to plantar flex and stabilize the first ray. Chronic jamming of your first MPJ can lead to hallux limitus, structural hallux rigidus, this dorsal bunion. It'll obviously lead to the inactivation or deactivation of your glutes. So if you are trying to make that connection between the big toe and the glutes and the gluteal amnesia, you must always think about the dynamic impact of first MPJ range of motion. I hope you enjoyed. If you want to learn more, please do check out our certifications barefoot training specialist as well as barefoot rx our level two series goes into gait assessment and things exactly like what i just covered the foot is obviously a very complex integrated area of the body but yet when you understand it it is so powerful stay barefoot strong